So, Bert, you know, there's there's another set of tests that are parallel to the mean test, two sixty two tests, which is the the parser tests. And overall, I think this separate organization is kind of unfortunate because I don't know if uh, browsers or JavaScript engines in general incorporate these other repositories into their uh, integration, their their continuous integration. So I think I think it would be important if if a separate repository is added to make sure that it sort of goes all the way through, and to consider putting it in the same repository if it if it doesn't, because it would be a waste to do a bunch of work on these tests and then have nobody use it. Yeah, that yeah. sounds like a really smart idea. I'm, and I'm. You know, I'm happy to follow up with, with Leo about this. Also, if if we get to a point where we have tests but they're not being run, then there are various things we could we could do. You know, another another thing we could do is contribute upstream into the engines to, to do the integration for them. Um, but they shouldn't be just sort of abandoned. Right. So, um, so someone just raised to me that I was um, I'm making a point earlier that I didn't finish and I should probably finish it around uh, the structuring of invariance around values um, and the way in which different invariants can uh, be more or less powerful in a given context. The one that we just discussed was uh, virtualizability within the scope of um, implementer uh, implementability. <laughs> Um, uh, and I think that this is an important thing to capture because, uh, you know, in a, in a vacuum, a lot of these decisions would be really easy to make, but we're not working within a vacuum. We're working within an interconnected system of moving parts. Uh, there's a couple of ways that we can record that, I think. Um, some invariants may be easier to write down than others, and we can just directly write those down and group them. Others may need a uh, more nuanced approach. And um, I don't exactly know what that's going to look like. Uh, one thing that I've used in the past in committee is I've suggested the language of should and must, uh, showing aspects uh, surrounding a, a given concept as being more strongly required or absolutely required, and others that should, in all cases, unless it's trumped by something else, uh, be followed. And in the case that it is trumped by something else, there's a reason why that happens. Okay, so things like the negotiated compromise on temporal uh, could be would be consistent with a, um, a primordials should have no hidden mutable state or mm -hmm. IO, uh, and then uh, the temporal is a, um, a compromise uh, where the uh, the IO is uh, easily quarantine quarantine is organized so that it's easily easy to quarantine. Uh, but it is there mixed in with a primordial object. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that's, that's a good uh, example of how that might work. Um, there was another detail. Ah, yes. Okay, so th there's another important detail to this. Uh, I agree with what Mark said earlier that invariants should be changeable and we should uh, maintain the changeability of primordial, of, uh, of um, invariants because um, if we don't, we may forget why they're there and the context may change so radically over the next 20 years or however long we're working on this um, that they may no, no longer make sense. So the rationale behind why the invariant exists must also accompany that invariant. Um, in the past, we've used uh, short terms such as security or integrity to describe these. It may make sense to make this to make a more de complete description of what the goal of the invariant is. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. I'll give you a great example of something that we used to take as an absolute invariant, uh, and then we uh, th uh, threw the invariant away. Uh, and we're happy to do so. It wasn't even controversial, uh, which is um, uh, the relationship between double equal and triple equal and typo um, uh, was um, the invariant was that uh, if type of A is the same as type of B and A double equals B, if it um, then A triple equals B. So so if the type ofs are the same, then double equals and triple equals are always in agreement. Um, and uh, 
the um, the uh, full value types uh, proposal would allow overriding a double equal but not triple equal, um, and uh, that would be an, an example of um, of having violated something that in ES5 era discussions, we actually took to be an invariant we couldn't relax. And now it seems like we're willing to relax it and nobody cares, which is interesting. That's a really great example. I think, I think also uh, when we bring this to committee, we should have these examples available to talk about the different cases because um, I think it'll make it easier to have that discussion. So to me, it sounds like we're all pretty much in agreement that writing down invariants and making them something that is agreed upon and in the specification is a good idea. It's something we should pursue. The exact shape of this is maybe not 100% clear yet, and we need to gather some details about this. I'm guessing we probably won't get all of the details and the design of this down in this meeting, but would it make sense to start an email thread with everyone who's in this call? Uh, and start gathering, first of all, invariants, um, examples of uh, how invariants have been adopted or not used, uh, where there was a should or must situation, uh, et cetera, and just start gathering so that we can start looking at what all of that looks like and making sense of it. Would that be a good step forward for this? Sounds good to me. Okay, um, so I can take responsibility for sending that email. Thank you. Uh, is there any further discussion we would like to pursue on this topic? Oh, oh. this is Jason. I just want to say that I am looking forward, maybe outside of this meeting, to having a more technical discussion about what these invariants are, you know, how to communicate them, um, and, you know, how to, how to get rationale and spec text uh, in place. Thanks everyone. Yeah, I think we can do that partially in the email thread and then uh, we can maybe, maybe in this meeting, I'm not sure if this meeting would be a good place to discuss that further. That's good. Yeah, uh, I also want to make, any. sorry. Sorry, go ahead. It's as good as any. Okay, I just want to make sure also uh, because Mark isn't feeling super well. Um, I want to make sure that uh, we do it at a time when we can have everybody like 100%. Good, thank you. Uh, let's tentatively plan. Uh, 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 Mark, may I propose that we tentatively plan to resume this discussion next week? Yes, let me just double check my calendar, but I believe that's fine. And perhaps we can simply reframe the conversation we had planned to have about the specific invariant into a conversation about invariants in general. Uh, I think we can do both and we can do both next week. Okay. Yeah, next week looks fine. Yeah, and let me just, uh, you, just you know, since, since I've, I've been um, uh, trying to prevent something without explaining the rationale and still haven't explained the rationale, let me just state the punchline for everybody's benefit, which is, uh, 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 and uh, Chris actually mentioned this, which is the problems with the exotic internal slots containing objects, uh, there is no fatal problem there. It is, it is one of these shoulds rather than musts, and it's an issue of trade-offs. Uh, and what those trade-offs are, and, and and when they hurt and when they don't is, is the thing that needs a presentation. Uh, to be clear, there's nothing pressing on the agenda after this if we would like to continue this conversation to time. And, and in fact, 
looking at the clock now, evidently time has passed faster than I recall. <laughs> I think it's like a good stopping point. And I, in fact, I, 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 I think we should let some time pass. And, and talk about okay. It. All right. Um, th there isn't really enough time to begin pursuing another topic in earnest, I think. Um, so I propose that uh, uh, I uh, stop the recording and, um, and perhaps let this meeting uh, finish early. Does oh, that sound good, everyone? How long is this meeting today? Um, it's, unless my clock's incorrect, it, it's usually one to, um, oh, wait. Oh, it's only two hours. <laughs> it's one to three. Sorry. We are, we're doing fine on time. <laughs> the value my types today would be up for presenting the core idea in like 15 minutes if we did want to cut the meeting shorter. If, if people are open to that, I thought it might be a fun topic, especially if. Sorry, sorry Dan, remind me, which idea I missed it? Uh, value types. I haven't presented this idea oh. to anyone. You, you, you all would be the. I mean, I typed an explanation yeah. to someone, but they didn't respond. I don't know if they understood. It. And I, I feel like I would, would, would understand, and it might be interesting. Yes, I would. I would appreciate that. All right, well, take it away. Uh, so, I think um, over the past few months, Mark's remarked a couple times that it seems like the constraints around value types are just unsatisfiable. And that made me sad. I was kind of, especially when we had the discussion around box, I was starting to come to similar conclusions. Um, but uh, the, the idea that I have is that, I mean, the, the, big, the big problem with value types is that you need, um, for two objects, you need some kind of registry such that when uh, you do two object on a value type, you get something that has the prototype you want. But um, that registry becomes this communication channel. Mark, is that, is that the problem you see also? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a good, yeah, that's a good entry point into the problem, yeah. Okay, so uh, my proposed solution is, what if we use lexical scope to, <laughs> for this registry? We like lexical scope, right? Yeah. So I'm going to share a code sample. So here, um, this would be the definition of a value type for a complex number. So there are two key parts. One is that value types have a key or a tag. So there's this, there's this API type.tag and type.untag. So the key gives you the capability to both produce values of that value type read their internal private contents. And because symbols are unique entities, most of them at least, uh, they, um, they, it, this works. Uh, it, it really preserves privacy because you only pass this symbol as it, this symbol represents this capability that, that's unforgeable. So you have this API type.tag where you, you have a record here. Now that we would have records in tuples, we have these arbitrary compound data types and big ints provide arbitrary binary data. And you tag it with this key and then you can untag it also passing the key. Uh, now, there's this big type construct. What does untag do? Let me make sure I understand. Tag wraps it and untag unwraps it? Yeah. Okay. So this is not the type of. The type of is part of the public API. If type of gave you this tag, then all encapsulation would be lost and people would be able to forge values and read the private data just from getting the type of. So the idea is that when you construct a new value type, you have both a key or tag, I guess I have to decide what, what analogy I wanna use between the two of them, and you have a separate type of. Um, then you also have a, a prototype for the wrapper, uh, and possibly operator overloading behavior. The other thing that you would have is a proxy handler. So if you want your wrapper to be an exotic object, then each one would use the same handler. And I'll go to another example with that later. So this type constructor does not communicate with any registry at all. It just, we just stored in this type property. This is just a convention. 
that I think looks looks nice. So you have the constructor, and then you also have the type. The only thing you can do with a type, or the main thing you can do with a type is make it available in a lexical scope. So uh, there's, there's no global communication about key. You can make multiple types that have the same key, but you have to have the key to make the type that refers to it. When you do with type complex dot type, what that means is that when we see two objects on one of these, it will look in the lexical, you can think of it, the enclosing lexical scope having like a stack of maps from symbols to these types, from these tags to the type constructor. And from that, when you do two object, you just look, okay, what's the, what, what is there for the key? Okay, I'll make a wrapper with this prototype. And it should, I think that should work. And similarly for operator overloading, we previously discussed in TC39 that operator overloading would be governed by lexical scope opt-in, which preserves a lot of important invariants. And the more I think about it, the more I think, well, if this is designed for value types, then maybe we should just make operator overloading coupled to value types, especially now that we have symbols as weak map keys that allow us to use value types to reference uh, to reference objects via via weak map that you know that this type definition could close over that weak map it's fine because you have to have a reference to this type definition to be able to do with type complex dot type and does it uh, first of all let me say i really like a lot about this and i think it's promising uh and clever i mean it's it's um uh the, it's making use of this obscure property that we already have for primitive values, that when you do a, the, a two object on a primitive value, uh, um, which prototype uh, it um, promotes it to um, uh, depends on, is, is a effectively a lexical property of the code doing the promotion, doing the dot. You know, if you, yes, um, exactly. Um, and uh, yeah, so um, so let me ask. Uh, so these value type, the value type. Let's say the 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 complex uh, the uh, complex value that this thing makes. Um, uh, that would be a first class value, so it could appear inside code that does not say with type complex type uh, if it appears in such code that has no lexical knowledge of complex type um, and somebody does a dot on it or you know or some equivalent to object on it uh, what happens it throws a type there so you all of this code above manipulates these values and carefully avoids all object operations on complex values because if they use them it would get a type error so in this case it this is just building off of that pattern established in the operator overloading proposal where operator overloading was also based on a type error when used outside the lexical declaration wow so can, um, where was that? That, that? I mean, this is something that JavaScript needed for so long. And I believe I've seen some examples that were not elegant. Uh, this is the opposite of that. This is like, I, yeah, like I, definitely worth giving it a lot more time. I'm, well, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, yeah I'm very <laughs> excited. So <laughs> thanks. Let me go to another example that uses the uh, that uses an exotic object. So here's a linked list. Uh, for a linked list, I'm using head and tail. I kind of want to write car and, and footer. Uh, but the the key thing is that in the in the type, we're allowed to pass a proxy handler because we want to be able to support like the nth element comes from um, 
you know, we want to be able to overload square bracket. So the way that works is, you know, everything gets this prototype. And then if you provide a handler, it, the, the wrapper becomes a proxy handler. So one, uh, one invariant I want to preserve is that there's no side effect that comes from two objects. So I didn't want to call a callback when you do two objects because that, that prohibits the way that engines like to work to avoid that. It, prohibits, it also inhibits the work that we did with strict mode to prevent the wrapper from being sort of observably created. When you have a strict mode method, it doesn't get the wrapper as the receiver. Right. So Good. I think if you just give it, let it have the prototype and the handler, then it's, then it's enough. And one, one further note about this wrapper, when we have these type, this type dot untag function works both on the primitive value and on the wrapper. You can distinguish them through, through type of, that the wrapper will have type of object or function, but, uh, and the other ones will have these sim other symbol type of, but uh, type of untag works through the media wrapper. Otherwise, it sort of doesn't make sense, I think. Otherwise, there's, there's nothing you can sort of do with the wrapper if you get your hands on a wrapper value. So uh, in the context, in, in, the, in the absence of lexical knowledge, when, when you just have the value as first class in uh, code that's lexically ignorant of it, um, uh, what, what, if anything, is enabled? Is the, the promotion to a prototype is not enabled? The operators are not enabled. Are the proxy traps enabled? All, all those, all object operations and type of would throw a type error. Basically, the only thing you can do is pass it around, uh, put it in things, and uh, call type dot untag. Okay, okay, yeah. In um, um, uh, Phil Wadler terminology, uh, it's completely parametric. Uh, in contexts that don't have the lexical knowledge. It's, you can't do anything with it other than pass it to somewhere where the lexical knowledge exists. Uh, right, yeah, it's like a top type. Yeah, yeah. I can't say I've, you know, full, you know, anywhere close to fully absorbed it. There's a lot of implications here. But I find this very promising and it, does not, uh, it does not hit any of my alarms at this point. Well, that, that's great. I don't know if we need to spend more time. I mean, if people have more thoughts I want to hear, but mostly I wanted to do a brief introduction and see if you saw problems. A couple that I, that I mentioned in chat here. Um, one of them is when you, gave this presentation 10 minutes ago, I heard dependencies on at least three other TC39 proposals that are in various stages of progress. I'm wondering how that's going to smell to the committee in general. I'm not a part of TC39. I'm just calling it out. So it's dependent on records and tuples. Uh, I'm working closely with the record and tuple champions, and I really hope that we can go to stage two next meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, I was thinking of making this part of the operator overloading proposal of sort of subsuming the current operator overloading proposal with this being operator overloading being coupled with value types. Right. Right. This gets rid of the main pain point of operator overloading, which is the operator overloading proposal without this. Uh, the, uh, th the values that you're overloading the operators on are still genuine objects with first class identity. And for a lot of right. use case, use, uses we want to make of operator overloading, uh, having them be objects rather than values is really unpleasant, and this would fix that. Yeah, and conversely, there were a bunch of use cases presented for operator overloading that would depend on, uh, that really wanted to be with references to objects. And I think now that we have symbol as weak map key sort of there, that will let us oh. build everything. And it won't, it won't be this fundamental restriction that I thought it was before. I see, I see, that's interesting. And it doesn't, it doesn't violate, I mean, 
Oh, wait, let me, let me talk through how I thought uh, membranes would work. So you want to be able to pass, you, you want to have a membrane system sort of automatically deal with these types. Uh, so the idea is that if what the, the membrane system would override, override this type constructor with something that, you know, so, so we trust the membrane system. Uh, we, so the membrane system gets the key. Uh, when it sees the, and when it sees this type pass over the membrane, then it says, okay, I'm going to replace it with something that's like this, but each one of these things individually membrane wrapped. So that then when you do two object, so then, then you can use it in the with statement, you know, because somehow you've passed this type over the membrane and you want to use it in the with statement and it will just work because the key is the same, the type of is the same. And then these things or the, or the proxy handlers will be membrane wrapped. So uh, Dan, you, are, uh, you might be making an assumption that isn't, uh, true for uh, for membranes. Uh, in general, uh, we don't. Uh, uh, membranes um, are not, in general, trusted in the sense that um, uh, you know anybody can create a membrane, and therefore, um, uh, if I encounter a membrane created by you, and I don't trust you, then I don't trust so your membrane. I meant the uh, the membrane so infrastructure. So there, there are two cases. If you don't tell the membrane, if you don't give the membrane infrastructure the right to cat override this, then it's fine. If you know you pass this thing over the membrane, uh, you haven't communicated the key to the other side, and they just get type errors when they try to use it. Uh, but if they, but if you do trust the membrane system to override the type, then it could make this sharing happen transparently. Okay, so this this does this does make the yeah I can see why you need to do it that way, or I don't see how to avoid that. But it does create a much more burdensome coordination uh, with the membrane. Right now, uh, a membrane can be uh, transparently practically transparently interposed um, uh, between two realms uh, without any knowledge of um, any of the particular things on each side. So um, uh, there's, so, so membranes basically are a generic combinator that you, know, you can create them, you can put them between object graphs that you're ignorant of and uh, except for edge cases, um, uh, uh, for the, all the practical, the sort of normal practical cases, um, everything works across the membrane transparently without any coordination with the membrane. Uh, the things that are interacting with the membrane don't need to know that there's a membrane there, and the membrane doesn't know, need to know any of the particulars of the things that are interacting with it. It's certainly going to be interesting for membranes um, because up until now, at least with my project, ES Membrane, uh, membranes just pass primitives right through. Um, and objects get wrapped. That's, is, that's the concept here. That you're still passing primitives right through. The question is, how do we wrap complex? Right, types? right. What I'm saying is we would have to teach membranes to handle that. So, the, but the other option as a membrane maintainer is to just say, okay, you can pass these primitives through, but they're not really usable on the other side. Right. I mean, I, I, I really actually, love what I'm hearing there. Yeah, actually, um, I would say that the second one is actually consistent with the stance you've already taken on lexical scope. Um, uh, with no membrane boundary, when you just pass one of these things from one module to another, and the receiving module has no static, has no lexical knowledge of the complex type, then it's just opaque. So if there's a membrane in the way, then it, that shouldn't make it any less opaque for the receiver. Right? A receiver that doesn't have static knowledge, it's opaque whether it comes through a membrane or not. 
Uh, right. Yeah. I was just thinking about if you wanted to make it work, then you would have to, you'd have to right. cooperate at the point of declaring the type. And okay. I guess there are a lot of different ways you could cooperate. Okay. And then the way you cooperate is let's just talk about how you cooperate between two modules. Uh, so uh, this module defines complex. Now, if it wants, when it, uh, so what would it export that another module could import such that some other module uh, could make use of complex? Uh, so complex the convention numbers. would be that you export the constructor and there's this convention, but it's not required at all that you put the type as a property called type on the constructor. So then you can use it with this, with this particular idiom. Okay. Uh, now, there, there's still separable capabilities. There's no reason why the capability to construct, you know, values of this value type should be coupled with the capability to put them in scope. But I think you usually do want to couple them. And so I think at a, at a convention level, you would you do like this. So the module would export complex. I would personally feel a little bit safer if the property wasn't named complex.type, but complex, uh, the, where the property key was itself a symbol of some kind that JavaScript or ECMAScript provided, um, simply because type is such a common name. I was thinking about that, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't want it to implicitly read the symbol property like this. We could do with type complex, and then that would implicitly read a symbol. But I felt like that would be kind of, if it implicitly read the symbol, I thought that would be kind of lower integrity because then you're making this, this really specific requirement that the type be found within this bigger structure that has the symbol. Okay. Um, but maybe we could find a different name that's not type. The thing is that type is just entirely a convention. So okay. if it doesn't work for your code base, you could just use something else. Right, the, 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 the width doesn't care about the, cons the, the width as you have, it doesn't care about the constructor. So the, the constructor doesn't even necessarily have to have been exported. Uh, the thing that needs to have been exported and imported uh, is this type object, however it's named. Uh, so what kind of, what is the type object? What is the thing that the type constructor creates? I don't know. It's like an object that has a few internal slots. There's nothing you could really do with it. Maybe the only thing that might, we, we might make the, the type of public. We definitely wouldn't make the key public. Uh, we, we could make the prototype or operators or handler public, but I think that would be a little bit weird. I think it would just be an object that has internal slots for each of these five things, these four that you see here in the handler, and then the type prototype might have a getter to get the type of, and the other things just held private. Okay, so uh, it sounds like Okay, so if you did, so the type thing would itself be a object, not a value, is that correct? Oh yeah, definitely, it points to all these objects, so. Right, okay, right, it has to be an object, right. Um, and if you, if we did, and so if we, let, if we just take a look at a pair of modules, A and B, without a membrane between them, uh, uh, a defines complex, exports the type object, B imports the type object, does the width on the type object, and now everything's fine. Now we put a membrane between A and B. The, the complex values go through the membrane with no problem. Um, the uh, exporting and importing of the type object through the membrane means that B gets a proxy for the type object. Right. Um, so, so that wouldn't have any of the normal type internal slots. And, sim and so it would simply produce a type error when you pass it into a with type declaration. Because you know the first thing with type will do is check, is this a type? And the proxy will not be a type. OK. So, so instead of thinking about having to prearrange each separate type with the membrane system. Is there some generic, generic special case oxymoron? Uh, is there some 
uh, or some rule we can adopt that's very specific to these type objects, such that a type object passed through a membrane creates on the other side something that's a valid type object. I'll have to think about that. that. It's, it's really, without adding a bunch of extra proxy traps, it's really hard for me to picture how that would work. Okay. Okay. But that's just offhand. I can't, I'll have to think about this some more. Okay. I was, I was really hoping that it was going to be just fine to patch type. That was part of my mental story for this. If that, if, anyway, if this is the only problem that I'm like thrilled, I thought there would be something else more <laughs> more obvious that it was wrong. Yeah, let me make it clear. I'm thrilled as well. Um, uh, so I think the, 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 you know, the, the gold standard for trying to get this to work through membranes is just think about how it works between two modules in the absence of the membrane, then put a membrane between them and see if it still works. A generic membrane between them. Um, so that, that's, that's, that's a goal. Um, let's see how close we can come to that goal. Yeah, I, mean, I don't. I don't have any ideas right now without the membrane being privileged. I mean, you you sort of only needed to be privileged on the sending side. I think. I think if you uh, the membrane, you know, if you have a membrane blocking, you know, wrapping things that go out from your module, and if that same membrane overrides the the type global, I think that would work. Uh, it's worth pointing out that membranes can wrap stuff coming in as well. Um, and that's actually a key design feature of them. Yeah. Um, well, I'll have to think about this more. I'd love to see a straw man on this. This looks incredibly beautiful. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, I'll add my voice to that. This, is, this seems like a, a real conceptual breakthrough. I like the notion of a with statement <laughs> in, in general. As it, as it, it has the implication of a with block without the indentage, indentation. Um, it's like everything following it is effectively equivalent to being inside of a with block, but it's not the with block that you know and hate. It's something new. It's redeeming with. <laughs> yeah. I had another idea for with, which was for extended numeric prefixes. If we did like with suffix, but this would be like a lexical declaration in a separate namespace. Uh, this, the goal would be to solve the, the problem where you have to put the underscore or some other extra token so that we could get like, mm completely mm -hmm. equivalent to what we have with big int. So I have just one, one question about width. Are, are we talking, it's, it's kind of like a top level only? Kind no, of? no, no, any lexical scope. Yeah, so yeah, you may, um, you may encounter, um, if, if, if we see, you know, the way modules kind of like said no, like import and whatever, the only top level in the end. So you may encounter whatever it is that leads to those becoming top level module. <laughs> um, not declarations, that would be rude, but at least they would only be top level module. Uh, there, there's precedent to that. Sure. Well, I yeah, think I to understand whether that's going to be the case, you have to understand why import is required to be at the top. And my understanding is that that makes it possible for a parser to quickly establish what um, the shallow dependencies of a module are without a, without a thorough parse. No, it was, it, was, it was more involved than that. I actually had a proposal for generative modules um, uh, that enabled uh, things like import to appear inside a function and be multiply instantiated. Um, and Dave Herman uh, succeeded, succeeded at attacking it in ways that I had no response to. 
Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't remember what those attacks were anymore. It'd be hard to reproduce. But, but my attempt to, to, to generalize it did fail um, under challenge from Dave, Dave Herman. Yeah, it's organized chaos. You can't really predict or guard against that, but there is precedent. <laughs> in this case, I'm pretty sure we could have these declarations at any lexical level. I don't see a reason to restrict these to top level. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. yeah. And also, there's, no, there's not even a reason to restrict these to modules rather than scripts. Oh, definitely not. Or even strict mode. It could be in sloppy mode. I don't see any Except for the use of width. <laughs> Yeah, well, fortunately, it's uh, there's no there's no syntactic ambiguity because there's because of the oh. environment. Well, oh, I wish that was the reason why things in sloppy mode are don't touch, right? Because sloppy mode works like magic, and if if you change any recipe of parsing and evaluation, and then somebody says their site broke and they don't know why, they only ever write sloppy code. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, so we, can't, we can't go changing things. So, maybe I could walk through examples of things I think we could implement through value types that I've, I mean, I haven't written up the code yet, this is just what I have in my head. But we could probably feel uh, like big in, in terms of tuples and 32 bit integers, or it could be in terms of uh, WebAssembly. Like, imagine you have a linear WebAssembly heap, you use uh, weak references and final finalization group finalization registry to to free the memory that's pointed that from a symbol that's contained in in a big int that's polyfill this way i think that would all work or you could have symbols right. that reference text arrays can i can i give you like a use case scenario because i was waiting for a chance to um, oh yeah yeah, so, so um, I, I, I used to do MATLAB and Java and then, you know, graduated and I was like, never going to pay them. Uh, and I, I, I wanted to make JavaScript, you know, be the replacement to that. So, so, um, so yeah, we want to we wanna think of WebAssembly um, executing, you know, FFT, you know, complex numbers. You, you focused a lot of, on complex numbers. But, but there are also um, other, other things that you do with computational science, uh, or I'll stick in my area of the woods, uh, color science. Um, so um, yeah, so, so like how would you, how would you consider, um, you know, go, going from, um, I guess, um, data types that are based on porting um, stuff to WebAssembly and going back and forth um, between JavaScript and WebAssembly functions that you're sure work and, and, and they have their own signatures? Uh, so, you know, with these methods that exist on, on prototypes, you could sort of do anything. So inside of the, the payload, you, you could have, so you have a record maybe, and the record could have uh, an integer, which is an index into a WebAssembly heap. It could also have a symbol, and we could have a weak map off to the side that's keyed by these symbols, where that where the value corresponding in that weak map would give you. Um, it could be, uh, you know, the WebAssembly memory, or it could be, uh, or it could be a value that sort of holds. That, that has a finalizer registered against it. Or actually, I guess the symbol can have a, would be able to get registered in a finalization registry directly. So this symbol is registered in the finalization registry and then when it becomes inaccessible, it would uh, free the, the underlying memory in the WebAssembly heap. So you have right. the two values of the offset and then the symbol that, that frees the memory and maybe you have one global WebAssembly heap, so you don't need to sort of close over it on a per uh, value basis. And then, you know, then you can just have methods that deal with it. I think it would probably be easier to just use ordinary objects for that, but the value types would give you operators and things like that. Yeah, so, so, so I'm, I'm kind of like interested. Uh, so, so I pasted a link, first of all, to some of the data structures and a library that is basically ported to WebAssembly. Um, and it, you know it's full of like all all the different data types that 
theoretically, some of them have browser equivalents um, um, of existing types. Um, so, so the idea that you would say that um, what, what I get out of WebAssembly um, is basically going to translate into this, um, um, you know, um, type that we're defining in JavaScript. So, so it's creating this uh, mapping um, based on something that you would add to the WebAssembly signature of your, you know, uh, WebAssembly module itself somehow. Um, did you think about like making that bridge? I'm, I'm having trouble understanding. I'm trying to open up the. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so for instance, if we're returning um, a point two F, so it's it's on that link. So I, I can share my screen, but let me organize. Oh, that'd be great because it looks like a really long article. Oh yeah. yeah. It looks like the kind of thing that we'd want to stick in standard library somewhere. Um, in this under the standard library proposal that's coming up. Yeah, I, I don't know. I'm a, not not happy with it. So, but I mean, I wasn't happy with it last year. Maybe they made a lot of progress. Um, so so for instance, you know, if you're returning well typed um, um, pointers to memory buffers, you know, somehow from WebAssembly. Um, you kind of want to want to say, okay, this is the data structure that I want to actually consume it as when it comes out of the WebAssembly function. I don't want to just get the buffer back. Um, I, I want to decompose this uh, or deconstruct this or something. You know, I don't know what the right terminology uh, would be. Um, yeah. So, so I think decomposing binary data is an interesting and important problem. And it's just an entirely different problem from the one I'm trying to solve here. Uh, to to a, to an extent, um, you you usually end up having a, a structure that is like a JSON object. Only in it, there's like all these funky kind of like values that um, you basically until today you either represented them as um, typed arrays or um, you just said they're all numbers and forget about the detail of what number uh, they are. Um, so would it be possible to define deep nested structures that way? Uh, I think this is something that would be more important, would make more sense to pursue in terms of the WebAssembly GC proposal, yeah. which defines these structured types and can, uh, or maybe it's even a thing at the tool chain level. Like I think, I don't see why you would use value types for this. I think you just want an object that can be there, there will be numeric types in the middle, and then you might do math math operations on things that are not coercible to a big int only, or not coercible to um, uh, other other uh, you know number basically. Um, yeah. Color space vectors that you might want to have operator overload on it would make sense to have them elevated to a value type. I think. Yeah, so so you're not having to do all that boilerplate at this point. The recipes are clear, uh, so you're just you're you're just really extending the vision to to say that uh, if you're computationally intensive. I think there's a blurry continuum here, and and where you draw the line is is I think a matter of aesthetic judgment. Oh yeah, so I think the the design here. Would let any arbitrary object be wrapped uh, based on a, a symbols uh, to be used in a, in a value type they could have operator overloading uh, so that you could apply that here in the example that you showed there was no use of operator overloading so I'm not sure if that's what you were getting at so I, I have a, 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 a somewhat tangential thought to that just I haven't completely wrapped my head around your your, your idea here, but I'm just really, really liking the, the general flavor of it. But some something that I've been thinking about for quite a while uh, is, the, is is having a more graceful way for uh, handling the serialization and deserialization of data in, into JSON. Um, and 
since, since, since one of my hats is the, the, the guardian, guardian of the immutability of Jason itself, um, I think the, the avenue for uh, extension is not in the syntax of JSON, but in the APIs for, for encoding and decoding. Um, and so one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot in particular is, um, you know, was, was actually, uh, what triggered me on this line of thought was, uh, was actually big ants. Um, since JSON has a syntax for integers and big ants could be encoded with them, but there's kind of no place to stand in the current encode decode pathway to take advantage of that. So I've been trying to think about ways one might extend the uh, JSON API uh, to do that. This feels like, and this is very hand wave, I mean, really, really vague, but it feels like this proposal has a place where such a hook could, could, could sit, where you treat the, the serialization, deserialization as another kind of operation like you know, addition or subtraction. Uh, wait, why wouldn't you just do this through object operation? Through what? Why wouldn't you use object operations for serialization and deserialization? Oh, because, because, uh, the, the coupling with the low level JSON syntax, um, makes it tricky. The, 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 the um, the, in particular, the, uh, replacer functions in the current JSON API, uh, are limited in that they only get to intervene once something is on the JavaScript side and they don't really have anything that they can do on the, the, uh, the textual side. Um, as I said, this is very vague and hand wavy, but I've been working on a design that involved having essentially some kind of type tag registry thing for, uh, for, for marking uh, various different classes of things is according to how they should get serialized. And this feels like a, a, a more elegant way of dealing with that, um, that problem of, of uh, uh, which you, you very eloquently dealt with, with the lexical scoping. And um, as I say, this is, this is very hand wavy, very, very kind of, I'm just groping in a kind of halting way towards something, but this feels like a, a fruitful avenue for exploration. So. Oh, are you thinking about how to avoid the, the serialization registry as a synchronization point? Is it yeah. a channel? Yes. Hmm. Should run this by Dave Herman. I think that he will be excited by it and probably have lots of good advice. Okay, I'll, I'll send Dave the write-up once I have it. That's a, that's a good idea. So uh, Dan, are you, are you satisfied that within this proposal, you could define the entirety of the semantics of decimal that you have in mind? Uh, so the, the whole is the, the literal syntax, and uh, which is a really superficial whole. If that's the only whole that I'm that I'm really you know uh, proud of proud of this, let me show you the the idea I had for decimal syntax. Um, so. Uh, so. Um, it's, there, there are sort of three ways that we can go about uh, having extensive literal syntax because we have the problem where you might want to use I for a suffix, but also I for a variable and things like that, or in for a suffix or in for a variable. It wouldn't make sense for a 2px to look up the lexical variable. So we sort of have three options. One option was that we have this leading underscore and the underscore is part of the name. One option was that we have uh, a namespace object, but that's just sort of out of the question. And the other option is that we have a separate lexical namespace for uh, for suffixes. And I want to I want to uh, push on that last one. I think if we had a separate namespace, you could think of these as implicitly like suffix something that's untypable, concatenated to the to the variable name, and this would be desugar into 
This would desugar into something that's a lot like uh, template literals. And then just call it as a function. So I was thinking about kind of various more exotic ways that you could do this and more exotic syntaxes. But I think people would actually want to just be able to append the suffix directly to it without any intervening. And sorry, can you write the, the you've written the expansion. Can you write the pre-expansion so I can see them at the same time? Uh, this would be the pre-expansion, just 2px. And it would expand into, um, so does that make sense? Uh, why are you using an object freeze on an object rather than using a record? Uh, because it would be usable in a weak map key. Because this is using the same pattern as template string literals. Uh, so it could be cached per source location. Huh. That detail might need some more thought. Uh, yeah, I'd be up for revisions on that, especially in this kind of weird thing where it pre-parses it as number, but then it's also available as a string. That was specifically requested by the CSS working group because they would want to be able to, if they have PX, they wouldn't want to have to parse it. Uh, but also in theory that could be handled by the same caching mechanism. So would the string still be two or two px um, canonical, uh, you know, normalized, whatever, you know, if it's all caps if, or, or lowercase? I thought it would be without the suffix, but it could, we could say that it has the suffix. I don't know. There, there's another question of what exactly the grammar should be of like which suffixes we permit because there's some things like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. So we, we would have to, we would have to be careful to find something that's complementary, but I feel like that's doable as long as we're okay with some restrictions. Here, here's another thing that might be worth calling out just as a side thing. Um, it might be worth calling out, um, uh, is it operator precedence or something like that? Um, I mean, normally that's a problem solved with parentheses. I'm just saying um, when you have characters adjacent to your PX, uh, it's got to be clear. And maybe it isn't implicitly. I don't know. I'm, I'm just speculating here. Um, am I making any sense at all? I did not understand. Yours. I, I did I, not understand. Yeah, I, I think that it's just suffixes would bind more tightly than any operator. Okay. Um, there's also another possibility you have to worry about. Um, I'm assuming that these are case sensitive, but more to the point, um, suppose you had an APX versus PX. So you have to specify, okay, does the A go with the PX in one? Um, yeah, uh, exactly. You would have to find a way to prohibit that. Yeah, uh, or just specify the rules on on how, how it's, um, yeah, I, I'm just calling it out. Yeah, at the yeah, very, no, that's <laughs> at the very least, the um, yeah, suffixes would be forbidden from beginning with um, a valid hexadecimal number. Or that, digit. Wasn't, that was not what I was getting at at all. Oh. Um, what I was getting at was a collision between names. Like, let's say a suffix um, was allowed for a string type. Um, then you have a, a possible suffix of APX versus a, a suffix of PX. And it's like, okay, you have to, you have a, um, you have a, uh, oh, I'm trying to uh, yeah. shift this conflict of some kind. Yeah, I think that that would be really easily solved by just, it would be unambiguous because you would be comparing the full token. Okay, again, just calling it out as a, as yeah. a yellow flag. So um, also um, one, one um, 
you know, uh, detail, um, you may use with, um, and, and code maintainability means that you would want to make sure you use the right with everywhere you're using it. But if we're saying um, that, you know, we have modules now in JavaScript, there is no need really for compiling. Um, so you might as well just uh, import suffix px from, um, you know, great suffixes, right? Or the yeah. suffixes. We could <laughs> yeah. do that. So <laughs> that's why I mentioned Dave Herman. Uh, he's, uh, he was, um, very adamant that the module system should leave the door open for importing hygienic macros um, or syntax extensions in general. Yeah, you can, we pipe that import as a suffix for px, import suffix px. Yeah, see, see I don't know if, if that will, because uh, I think some will say, oh, that import statement should not also at somehow import a non suffix or a different. Yeah, I would really like to not mess with the import syntax. Both that neither, neither this proposal nor the type proposal makes any change to the module system. And I'd really like to do my best to avoid messing with that because that's a lot of complexity. There's a lot of syntactic forms. And it seems like this is just sugar. I think um, if you do px and then you do with suffix px equals px, then you have yeah. that installed locally. So, I so a little bit I'm, of with you. I'm with you. The file is okay. Yeah, so I, I'm totally with you. But the reason why I raise it is just could we say that if we decided we wanted, we know that we didn't not uh, think around it? You know, like well, future. That's, you know? That's yeah, ju just you know, brainstorming until until we're sure we didn't like create a kind of an impossibility to kind of like add that one last feature that everybody keeps keeps asking for, and then they decide they're not going to use it. So, right, um, right. So we could have an export suffix px form and an import suffix px, and it would look like a separate sort of part of the namespace. And this could even be spelled. So say you import uh, star from and then you do CSS dot you could spell it like this. You could be spelling for the module namespace object. But I think this would also be fine, right? Uh, aside from the fact that it now becomes a uh, non-identifier uh, name, well, technically it's like a, an, a keyword identifier combo yeah, with uh, space in the middle. So, um, we, yeah. Not, uh, yeah. 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 I, I wish we had done this for a template literal tags. Did them in a separate namespace? Yeah. Uh, the problem is that used at, in the tag position, you know, inside the template literal, um, the tag name for usability really wants to be very, very, very short. But very short, but, but having a lot of very short names, uh, just as le names and lexical scope, of course, interferes with other things. And they don't need to be short in any other context other than their use as a tag. So to have more ceremony around defining them, exporting them, importing them, bringing them into scope, uh, such that you can then have a short name used as the tag uh, with the same, you know, using exactly the same kind of thinking about partitioning the lexical namespace that you're doing here, I think would have been a good idea for template literal tags, but obviously it's too late for that. Yeah. Hey, do I think it that you're in favor of exploring in this direction for extended numeric literals? Uh, yeah, not, not necessarily that we would allow it in the, you know, the, um, the, the, full, the full proposal corresponding to the text that's in front of us here. I don't know that I'm in favor of that either. But even without that, the, you know, this proposal you started with is basically saying that PX is a lexical name, but it's not in the, it's in this new uh, 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 na uh, lexical namespace of suffix names. 
as if you were mangling in this percent suffix percent. Um, you could, we, could, we could have done the same thing. Uh, so just, just thinking about the mangling, the hypothetical mangling, the mangling that you can't write down. Uh, we could have done the same kind of thing for template or literal tags. Well, uh, this makes me very happy if you're, if you're okay with this. That means that the decimal proposal, both versions, the decimal 128 as well as big decimal, would be fully polyfillable as value types with extended literal definitions. As long as you have this sort of two line prelude uh, with suffix and with type. Um, mm -hmm. The only thing it wouldn't let you do with, if you were going to polyfill number, is it wouldn't let you have man, and it won't let us define, it would be very awkward to define new things that are like negative zero. Um, because I'm, I, 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 I'm, I'm fine with that. I don't want any more nans or negative zeros. Yeah, I feel like it should be a design goal to not give people tools to add more things like nan. Negative zero, I guess, could be debatable, but I still don't really see motivation for it. Uh, I, I, I agree with uh, uh, your emphases on both of those. NAN is really bad because it makes equality non-reflexive. Um, uh, negative zero simply makes uh, equality a less precise equivalence class, but it still has all the algebraic properties of an equivalence class. But it's right. still bad, right. just not as bad. Right. So what we decided, I mean, not what we decided, what's the current proposal for records and tuples is that the definition of triple equal of strict equality would be sort of based on same value zero. So okay. zero and zero, when nested in records and tuples would be identified with each other, but like a tuple containing nan would triple equals a tuple containing nan. And so that right. definition would uh, like ricochet up through all these value types Good. where maybe you could overload double equals, but triple equals would be that version that's defined, uh, you know, automatically. Yeah, I think, I think same value zero is, that, is, the, is the right compromise for things that are intended to be, in, intended to include things that are used in a number like fashion. And we would still support object dot is, which is really precise, fully precise. I, I think also it allows people to finally have ranges as expressed, um, you know, as expressions not as a new range and then you put all that funky mojo in there um so so i'm not sure if it made it um anywhere in in proposals yet but uh, the double dot notation i don't know if if uh, folks considered um, you know number to number as double dots um but i i see the problem with that is that you could have um, the, what do they call it again? <laughs> the um, interval couldn't be just ones. And that, yeah, the double dot notation definitely makes that look ugly. So, all right. For reference, uh, for reference, uh, there is a number dot range and big in dot range proposal at stage one. Yeah, thank you. I'll check it out if it goes to two. <laughs> Thanks. If everyone could review the notes, they are sparse, but uh, just to make sure that we captured all of the important uh, highlights and represented everybody correctly, that would be great. Uh, and the notes are linked on the calendar invitation if you don't have a link. Okay. Okay.
Yeah, if you also uh, paste a, a link to the notes into the chat. Um, about the calendar events, um, I still have two events, and I remember there was a good reason for that. Um, but I think they're now out of, out of sync. One of them has the link and the other doesn't. Um, could we try to synchronize that? I think Ferridi is, um, yeah, the, the, one, the invite from Ferridi is the one that doesn't have the link in it. So. I'm sorry, so let me, who is able to fix this? Uh, I, I believe I believe I, I have an invite for, from the Agoric side, and the other invite uh, I believe is for, from Caridi. Oh, right. There's an old calendar event that overlaps that has overlapping invitees that we really need to retire. Uh, that's owned by Caridi. Um, yeah, one has 50 invitees, and and the current one that we. I believe updated recently. Uh, the one from the Agoric side has 30 only, so I'm not sure if we want to merge um, the lists for. So, yeah, the the um, there is the Google Group SES strategy, um, and uh, the um, the calendar entry does have that as an invitee, and I believe the way these things compose is that um, uh, Calendar and Google Groups uh, know enough about each other so that uh, effectively everyone who's a member of the group is an invitee on the calendar entry. I believe that's the case. So what to do is uh, use the Google Group to manage the, conti the continuing invitees to the meeting. And we should do that on, you know, with Chris Qualls calendar entry and retire for Caridi's calendar entry. Yeah, uh, I think that would work. Thank you. Uh, if we've run out, uh, it's always fine to adjourn early. Uh, is there anything else anybody would like to uh, talk about? I will stop the recording. Thank you. Thank you all.